Hello everyone and welcome to MS2900 Exploring Media Theory. Uh, we're up to week 6 now and this is the pre-recorded lecture for the lecture on Marshall McLuhan. So this week we're going to look at the work of the Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan. McLuhan is very famous and his work has been very influential in a number of areas of study. And his work and phrases still appear regularly in popular culture today. And as I'll go through this lecture, I'll use a number of these phrases and hopefully you will be able to recognise them and will have heard them before. McLuhan wrote most of his work during the 1960s and 70s and was quite influential then. But by the 1980s his work tends to have been a little bit forgotten and things have moved on a bit. Um, and by the mid-1990s he wasn't as cited anywhere near as much as he had been. However, with the advent of the internet, his work came back into favour and he's now much more uh, widely regarded again. Um, so one reason for his popularity is that his work proved to be amazingly prescient regarding the internet. He identified and predicted many of the phenomena that we have seen in recent years. And his work seems to offer great insights into media technology and the understanding of the impact of technology upon society. Now we've looked at a number of theories on this course. We started off looking at various theories of mass society and various other bits. We moved on to some discussions of Marxism. And so really I want to try and show you where McLuhan kind of fits into our scope because really we're talking about different perspectives looking at the media. Now one way we can categorise theories of the media is to look at whether they focus upon the form or the content of the media. So formalist theories are theories in which the form or qualities of the media are considered important. And this approach was very strong in early media theory where the new qualities of the media were thought to bring about changes. So the emergence of radio and the emergence of uh, cinema and television which had different, slightly different qualities to radio, these are thought to change how people interacted with it. Now opposing formalist theories which look at um, the actual physical qualities of the media, we've got what's called cultural theories. And these are theories where the content of the media is considered to be important. Attention focuses upon how meaning is made and how the politics of media impact upon us. Culturist approaches became strong in the 1980s and early 1990s and played a heavy part in the emergence of what is now known as cultural studies, which looks at text and looks at meaning and how texts uh, create particular associations and how they develop particular forms of political narrative. Now McLuhan's work, is, and especially his later work, is very formalist and it's concerned with how the qualities of the media technology interact with us and impact upon society. So the main thing to remember is McLuhan follows this formalist trajectory. Now I want to turn to a, a bit of a biography of McLuhan. Um, McLuhan's work reflects many of the personal aspects of his life and you can see links across between what was going on in his personal life into what he was saying in his academic work. So he was born in 1911 in Edmonton, Alberta in Canada um, and he was born to a Baptist father and a Baptist family. His faith was very important to him throughout his life and he converted to Catholicism with the blessing of his father in 1937. He was married in 1939 and had six children and throughout his academic, um, though he had academic positions his whole life, uh, because he had such a large family he found the salary from an academic position was not enough. So he also took work with advertising agencies and as a speaker at advertising and marketing events. He even appeared in a Woody Allen film. And I might show you a little bit of that later on. Uh, he had a stroke in 1979 and lost the ability to speak and passed away in 1980. In terms of his academic life, well he attended the University of Manitoba and got his BA in 1933 and then his MA in 1934. But he wanted to attend the University of Cambridge to do his PhD. And when he approached Cambridge, they said, well, you can come here, but you can't just start on a PhD. We really want you to have a BA from Cambridge as well. So he went back and joined the second year of a BA at Cambridge, I think at the particular college was Trinity Hall. 
um, and he got that BA in 1936 and started his PhD studies. Um, in about 1937 he took up a f his first teaching job at St Louis and it looked like a war was going to break out which eventually did start in 1939. So he approached Cambridge again and they gave him particular permission for him to carry on doing his PhD at Cambridge while living in the US. Um, so he was able to study while living in the US and he didn't actually have to attend to receive his viva so he was just awarded his PhD finally in 1942. From St Louis he moved to on, uh, Assumption College in Ontario and then finally to the University of Toronto. Um, and from there he also did hold various visiting positions at other universities, primarily in the US. Um, he became a, he, so he studied under the psychologist and theorist I. Richards and the literary theorist F. R. Leavis. And these two had quite an impact upon his work. And he studied under them whilst he was at Cambridge. Uh, when at Toronto, he uh, worked with Harold Innes, who was another media theorist. And together, they founded the Toronto School of Media Theory, which is still going today. And it's still quite an important centre for the study of the media. Although it does have a particular emphasis on the kind of media analysis that McLuhan and Innes were doing. In terms of publications, well, he f published his first book, was called The Mechanical Bride, 1951. It was then 11 years before he published The Gutenberg Galaxy in 62. And Understanding Media, which is the one that really broke him into the popular world, was 1964. The Medium is the Massage, an Inventory of Effects, was 1967. War and Peace in the Global Village is 1968. And From Cliché to Archetype in 1970. He was working on the last text when he passed away, and that was completed by his son, Eric Blair, and that was The Laws of the Media, published posthumously by Marshall McLuhan and Eric Blair in 1988. Uh, he also started the journal Explorations in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Now, his style of work is quite interesting. Uh, his work does not read like a normal academic book, so it's a bit odd and you have to approach it in a slightly different way. He used what he called the mosaic style, and this is a very much what we might term today a non-linear approach. So there's lots of short chapters that can be read in any order, which is why I've done this slide like this, so you can read this slide in any way, it probably wouldn't work very well like that. But McLuhan was a very popular and key figure in US uh, popular culture. And we were visited by many leading figures of the time. For example, the Beatles visited him, as well as a number of others. His style of writing is very much of the time of the 60s. And it might seem a little bit, well, not formal enough to us now. Um, there's very little of use of footnotes. There's no references. So it's a different way of writing to a normal academic thing. Um, his work is full of pithy little uh, comments that sound good and make sense in a broader body of his theory, but really don't seem to, lack, to have very much rigour. So, for example, he said things like the global village, which I'll talk about later on. It's a good phrase and we all understand what it means now, but he never really defined it. He talked about the medium is the message, and then, f then he changed that to the medium is the massage. So he played around with language, because he had worked in advertising as well, if you remember, and he was a literary theorist. So he had a very good sense of language. He came up with a great phrase, all technologies are the extension of our physical and nervous systems to increase power and speed. So again, our topic I'll talk about a bit later on, but these sound good and they're picked up today and used a lot. But maybe just on their own, they seem to lack a little bit of vigour. Now I just want to show you the Woody Allen clip here, if I can get this to come up. There it is. So I don't know if this will work, we'll have a try. So I have to say, this is from the film Annie, um, I'm in Hall, actually. I've always felt he was essentially a, a technical filmmaker. Granted, La Strada was a great film. Great in the, its use of negative imagery more than anything else. But that simple cohesive core, you know, the need to an artist to work, even from one to the other. Screaming is a pain to my ear. You know what I'm talking about? Like all that Juliet of the Spirits or Satyricon. I found it incredibly indulgent. You know, he really is. He's one of the most indulgent filmmakers. He really is. And without, without getting... Uh, 
But was he depressed at all? Oh, I miss my therapy. I oversleep. How can you possibly oversleep? The alarm clock. You know the hostile gesture that is to me? I know, because of our sexual problem, right? Everybody online at the New Yorker has to know our rate of intercourse. It's like Samuel Beckett. Now, I admire the technique, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't hit me on a gut level. I'd like to do this a gut level. Stop it, Ali. He spins on my neck, you know? He spins on my neck. neck. Oh, 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 oh. And you know something else? You know, you're so egocentric that if I miss my therapy, you can only think of it in terms of how it affects you. It's a double tongue shot. Probably on the first day, Greg. Probably met by answering an ad in the New York Review of Books. Thirty-ish academic wishes to meet woman who's interested in Mozart, James Joyce, and sodomy. Our sexual problem. I mean, I'm comparatively normal for a guy raised in Brooklyn. Okay, I'm very sorry. My sexual problem. Okay, my sexual problem. Huh? I never read that. That was, that was Henry James, right? No, the the sequel of the, the Turn of the Screw? It's the influence of television. Mm -hmm. Now, Marshall McLuhan is in it in terms of it being a, a high, a, a high intensity, you understand? A hot medium. When I was as a for a large sock. As a horse to do it. What do you do when you get stuck on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Yeah, well, it's just one of the things. It's a great country. You can give it. You have to give it so loud. I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, look, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan. Oh, really? really? I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insight to Mr. McLuhan will have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so, yeah, just let me, let me come over here a second. Oh, I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean that my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Why, it's life for only like this. <laughs> So there we go. Um, anyway, so Marshall McLuhan's appearing. He appeared in lots of forms of popular culture. He was a regular guest on various TV shows and things. Okay, well let's have a look at his journey. So he started out in English literature, as I mentioned. He um, worked at Cambridge. He got two BAs, did his first in Canada, and came across and did another one at Cambridge University. And he worked with a famous literary theorist, F.R. Leavis. And he followed Leavis's lead and started to examine not only literary texts, which is the traditional subject of study, but also other forms of text and applying literary analysis to other textual, uh, to other, other things, uh, particularly like adverts. So his PhD was on the study of adverts from a literary perspective. And then he turned that into his first major book, which is called The Mechanical Bride. And this was on advertising. And it was the first time anyone had studied advertising as texts. But from this position, he developed the idea that it was not the content of the media that is important, but it's the form. So he's saying we can apply literary analysis to, I don't know, to Shakespeare, to Chaucer, but also to a TV commercial. Now what differentiated them is the form in which the media is delivered to us. So he started focusing upon this form and started studying that. And he began to argue that technology, and specifically media, leads to great cultural changes. So it's the type of technology that causes the transition, rather than what the technology is communicating. So it's the form of the media, rather than the content, that has an impact upon people. And he develops this, um, his own interpretation of human history. And he proposed what we might call a schema that divides human history into four distinct technologically orientated ages or epochs. And these ages are determined by the sense that is most used to communicate. So he's looking at the technology of the time and looking at the kind of senses, whether it's sight or sound, that we use to understand that. So he looks first of all at what he terms a primitive age. And during this primitive age, most people communicated by talking. This is when we, we related stories around a campfire and we communicated uh, our histories through the spoken word. Mainly because we didn't write anything down, because we couldn't. Writing hadn't been invented. And this, of course, takes up the vast majority of human history. And I think writing was probably only invented about 3000 BC. So anything backwards from 3000 BC fits into McLuhan's 
um, approach here. And during this period, the most dominant sense was to listen. Uh, our hearing was the most powerful sense in communication. So we spoke and listened. Other senses weren't anywhere near as important to us. Now once you develop writing, um, as occurs from about 3500 BC, firstly writing on stone tablets and carving little marks into clay, and then moving on to papyrus and various other forms of animal skin, and then various forms of animal skin, and then finally paper and so on, we, we begin to develop what's termed literature, literate age, in which books and texts started to be produced. And the visual age gained some importance as visual artifacts became more widespread. So the more people can see these things, the more important the visual sense becomes in communication. The reason I'm arguing that visual sense isn't needed for other aspects of life, it was just that in terms of communication with other people, first it was the oral sense, and then it became the visual sense. And as the visual age matures and gradually turns into what he termed the print age, which was the invention by Gutenberg of the printing press, um, we get another change. And uh, written materials are now widespread and, and the visual sense becomes the dominant sense. And that supersedes in all others in, t in terms of how we communicate with other people. So with the written printed press, with the written notes and things like that, we can actually relate human history, we can relate stories ourselves, we can pass our messages across communities, we can bring communities together. And if you look back at the history of politics, the pamphleteers of the 19th century played a great part in developing our contemporary sense of politics. And this was all due to the printed press. And the only way we could understand the printed press was through the visual sense. So the visual sense comes to dominate from about the 18th century onwards, right the way through. Now, as we moved into the electronic age, with electronic media, uh, more senses come into play again. And our other senses begin to play a greater part. And I'll talk more about this in a moment. Now, McLuhan argues that the system of media technology that dominates each age, whether it's auditory, textual, print and electronic, plays a considerable part in structuring human experience. Media technology, therefore, operates as the prime mover in structuring human interaction and experience of the world. So it's the technology that we use to engage with the world structures how we experience the world. And different technologies require us to use different senses, which change very significantly how we experience the world. And of the various ages, it is the print age which McLuhan has the greatest reservations. And he'd argued that sensory lives of individuals living within it were fragmented and impoverished. Because we're only using one sense to communicate with, we tended to leave, lead poor lives. So the electronic age is understood, however, to offer salvation, as it incorporates a new and more diverse multi-sensory environment. When a radio comes along, and then television required us to use two of our senses at once. And with the advent of multimedia, which unfortunately McClure missed because he passed away in 1980, we were required to use even more of our senses in combination. So as well as sight and sound, we now have to use haptic interfaces. Haptic refers to the way in which we um, move around in space to control things. So if you think about when you stand in front of a, a PlayStation or an Xbox and you move your hands to control it, that's haptic sensors. Also when you shake your phone to make it do something or when you hold it up in a particular way, those are called haptic interfaces. So we're using physical movement to interact with it. And when you think of GPS and how technology is able to monitor our physical presence in the world and our spatial things. So virtual reality and other augmented systems involve using balance, touch and other sensors. And if you think of a, an iPad using touch to communicate with a system, compare that to the electronic age, which is primarily, sorry, to the literate age, which is primarily visual, we're far more engaged, we use far more modes of interaction with media today than we have ever done in the past. Now, McLuhan used this core idea to develop other ideas. And I want to talk about each of these in turn. So he talked about remediation, he talked about sensorial extension, the medium is the message, and a global village. So if we turn to remediation, 
Well, this is idea, his idea that new forms of media, new systems, borrow from previous forms. And it, he, he argues that all media borrow systems, techniques, styles and social significance from previous forms of media. And all media is essentially remediation, new combinations of old things. So if you look back at these ancient manuscripts, uh, these are developed in Western Europe from around the 1100s. And it was typically, you know, you'd have a large kind of letters there, you'd have the words here, you have the lovely illustration. These are called illustrated manuscripts. And they're typically uh, religious in origin. And in, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, you get the development of newspapers and so on. And you can see directly there's a link here. It's a visual link. So they're using the layout, perhaps, of large prints up the top and things like that. Um, so th this was a, a publication from 1939 um, or 1940. So you can see a link there. Now, moving on, what we call this kind of um, typography here is, of course, it's, it's a headlines, aren't they? So it's a Western newspaper, you got the headlines here. And then when you look at how television and radio were structured, well, you end up with the headlines again. So it's the reduced news given to you in brief, and a similar kind of thing here. And then if you turn to right up to date with web pages, how they're structured as well. This is the Guardian newspaper online. So it's using the same kind of basic layout. You've got headlines there, followed by smaller stories. But these are interactive, so these do something slightly different. So although the actual technology is completely different, here we're going from uh, hand-drawn manuscripts, we're moving into the printed media, we're moving into radio and television, and then we're moving into digital and web media and the internet. You can see a link. You can see pathways, remediation. The ideas are flowing from one to the next, and it's simply restructuring, repackaging older ideas. So that's the idea of remediation. There's the key idea here of sensorial extension. So when McLuhan um, was working at the University of Toronto, he worked with the economist Howard Innes. And Howard Innes argues, or argued, that some media are time-based. They last a long time, but cannot move easily across space. So if you think of things like stone tablets, etc., a stone tablet lasts forever. Or you think of a cave painting, it lasts a long time, but it's fixed in place. Only one person can go and see it, or a group of people can go and see a cave painting. You can't move them around. Other media, however, are space-based. They can move across space very easily, but don't tend to last. So if you think of how long a TV broadcast lasts, or a radio broadcast, it's over in the time that it's, it's produced. But it reaches a whole multiplicity of people. people. Similarly, newspapers go out to many millions of people, but again, they don't tend to last very long. Papyrus was the same way, and there's very few papyrus left from when they were first used two and a half thousand years ago, or three and a half thousand years ago. So McLuhan develops this idea of Innes, um, that media work in different ways. So he's looking at the form of the media here, and he's saying different media have different qualities. And whereas Innes has divided them into two broad camps, um, time-based and space-based, McLuhan takes it and develops it. And he draws, drawing upon the idea of media working with particular senses, he looked at how they interact with the body. And indeed, media and technologies work with the senses or the functions of the body. And what McLuhan argued is that media extend these functions or extensors. So there's a quote from him here. All media are the extension of some human faculty, psychic or physical. The wheel is an extension of the foot. The book is an extension of the eye. Clothing, an extension of the skin. Electric circuitry, an extension of the central nervous system. So all technologies basically extend our bodies in capacity and ability. What a technology does, it allows us to do something that we want to do physically or psychically or mentally, and allows us to do it in a better way. They take our interests and push them further. So McLuhan proposes that the extension of senses radically changes our experience of the world and accordingly the culture of those involved. So advances in technology bring about changes in cultural form and it is the changes in technology that drive social change and development. 
So technology is driving, because it extends particular senses, it changes the way we experience things, it changes society. And then he gets on to this big phrase, the medium is the message, which is the one you may have heard of. So Mel McLuhan proposes that rather than focus upon the content of the media, attention should focus upon the form, because that's the important bit. And it's the form in which the content is delivered. And it's the form of the media, rather than its specific content, that has the power to structure human relations and human action. And he even describes focusing upon the content of the media as a problem, because it's like a burglar throwing down a juicy piece of meat for the guard dog of the mind. If we spend all our time focusing upon the content, we're missing the big thing that's going on, which is the change of the media forms itself. So we shouldn't look at what the media are saying to us, we should look at how the media are saying to us. New forms of media bring about new forms of interpersonal communication, and it's that the McLuhan contends we should be focusing upon. So if we want to understand social change, we should look to the media. We should look to the type of media that's doing. They change things. The media are the message or massage, rather than the content that the media do. So that's what that phrase means. When he says the medium is the message, it's the medium we should be focusing upon. Not what's said on Facebook, but on that we're using Facebook. Not what's going on on WhatsApp or on television, but the fact that we're using these different things and those technologies interacting with how we experience the world. The medium is the key bit for McLuhan. Okay, he came up with this great phrase, the global village, which is really the one very popular today. And by this though, he means quite a particular thing. So with the shift from the visual to the electronic media, societies change, as I've explored a moment ago. And we lose the individual, fragmented nature of print culture, and into a new age of the global village. Now here, he's at odds with some of those mass society theorists that said we've moved from a more homogeneous model in previous times to a more atomized age. McLuhan is saying it's the other way round. We've moved from an atomized age to a more globally minded one. We've got this shared global mind. We now know what's going on on the other side of the world. We share common problems. We appreciate the common problems of global warming, of international wars, of international terrorism. So we think differently in the modern age to how we thought differently. So to how we, f how we thought previously. However, McLuhan's a bit sees this as a problem and he says it's not a good thing as systems of control tend to be deep-seated um, when you've got the whole world kind of come together with a single way of thinking the control systems for how we think about the world are vast enormous very deep-seated and very difficult to change and previously when we had the more individualized and fragmented idea of print culture um, the control systems tended to be local and we could change them. We could adapt the way in which people think because there's only a very limited amount of media. Now we're completely living in this media saturated world. We're part of much bigger systems, part of the global village where there, are glo there is a global hierarchy now. Okay, in terms of criticism, well, I want to look at four main areas of critique that people have levied against McLuhan's work. Firstly, in terms of evidence, evidence, he is not empirical at all. There is no real evidence for any of his theories. They are just pure theories. Um, and in the social sciences, we, we don't try to prove things true, but if someone puts a theory forward, we expect it to be voiced in such a way that we can at least test it and try to prove it's wrong. And if you can't prove it wrong, then we sustain with it. But unfortunately, McLuhan thinks, how do you possibly go around testing his ideas? How do we know media are the extensions of man? What experiment could we do to show that media are or aren't the extensions of man? How could we disprove Marshall McLuhan's thoughts? And because they're not operationalized or articulated in a way in which we can test them, there is a problem there. Secondly, there's an issue of historical accuracy. And his account of the development of media seems quite different to verifiable history. 
It seems nice, but it takes a lot of liberties with historical data. Um, and he seems to condense periods of time and let's stretch other periods of time out. And he, his phenomena that he talks about seem to overlap different periods of time. Also, is his model of history universal? Do all societies follow this particular path? Or is it just Western ones? What about societies that have leapt forward and jumped over bits of things? Are they subject to the same problems that others that haven't done it? So there's a few problems with historical accuracy. Then we get on to the issue of theoretical problems. Um, his, there's, his theory is what we might term normative, and it takes certain conditions, certain experiences, and says this is how things should be. Now other societies might encounter the history that McLuhan talks about in a different order. Are they at fault? Are those societies somehow broken? Is it problematic? He also gets very heavily criticised by disability theorists. Um, because while he talks about the different senses having, you know, becoming apparent with different media, and he says the uh, literate age is the most problematic one because we're using primarily the visual sense, yet the electronic age with multimodality and the way in which we use different senses, that's the best and it allows us to um, use all our senses at once. That's saying, well, a person that does use all the senses is a better person that only uses a limited number of senses. If the multimodal world is better because we're able to use all our senses, surely implicit with that is the idea that we should use all our senses. Does that mean then that a person that doesn't have all of their senses is somehow less of a person? This is what a disability theorist would argue. And they would say, you know, we're humans regardless of whatever senses or whatever physicality we're doing. Just because you're blind, it doesn't mean you're less of a person. Because you are deaf, you are not less of a person than the person who is not deaf. You're still a person. It's only us saying that the sense is important. And the, per the, hum the humanity is still there. So it's very important to make these kind of considerations. Are blind people not as human as the rest of us? And he's also based on some rather questionable ideas. And these are partly related to his faith. He also talks about a soul and the idea of perfectibility. is deeply woven within his work. This, of course, is drawing upon his religious background. Now, the final area of study is technological determinism. Does technology really determine our society? Are media really the extensions of our senses? Um, you know, do they actually make us do things? Um, so I'll give you an example. Does the train make me come to work in the morning? Does my car or bike make me come to work? No, of course it doesn't. Um, it allows me to come to work, but it isn't driving me forward by any means. I choose to do something and the technology facilitates that action. So what McLuhan's arguing, at a social level, technology is changing society. But does it? And if it does, does it do it because it extends the sense? Well, these are all topics that we'll try and pick up a little bit in a seminar. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you've got any comments about it, um, please put them in the comments section below. Again, this week, I've tried to do a slightly different style of PowerPoint. I listened to some of the... Um, comments from the last time. Some of you said you didn't like it and one wanted more slides, so we've got slightly more slides and other people said they preferred the new style with the better designer slides. So hopefully this is a bit of a happy medium. If you could let me know either through the comments or drop me an email, I'd be very grateful. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.